The American Embassy in Tehran has been occupied by demonstrators. There is no indication that any of our people have been hurt. On November 4, 1979, the revolution in Iran took an unexpected turn. A band of students stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran and took dozens of Americans hostage. This would become one of the worst diplomatic crises in American history. This is a message of the students in the American Embassy of Tehran. We are not against the people of the USA. We are against of the United States policy in Iran. Emboldened by the uprising of the Islamic Revolution, the students lashed out at the United States and took hostages, 52 American diplomats and other citizens. The embassy takeover was supposed to be a platform for protest. It took on a degree of permanence, though, as the students soon made their demands clear. Hand over the Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, who was undergoing surgery in New York and had been diagnosed with cancer. They insisted he face trial for crimes they said he'd committed during his 37 years in power. The hostage standoff would last 444 days. It became a huge political liability for U.S. President Jimmy Carter, who would lose re-election to Ronald Reagan in 1980. All Iranian diplomatic and consular officials have been declared persona non grata and must leave this country by midnight tomorrow. Similarly, AP journalists had been declared persona non grata two months before the embassy takeover. Now they were being allowed back into the country. The Tehran Bureau was back in business. Thierry Campion, a young photographer from Paris, was chronicling the revolution. He'd already spent four months photographing Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini while the exiled leader was living outside Paris. As it happened, the time spent staking out Khomeini in France would prove useful for covering the embassy takeover. So this is Khomeini in Nofle Chateau that was exiting the place where he was doing his meeting. So I put plastic on it and, uh, and I pin it here during the revolution. And it helped me a great deal because people saw that I was his friend because you have an impression of closeness in these pictures. Even as I told you, he never speak to me, but uh, it was the best, yeah, the best passport. Many photojournalists weren't so lucky. Some had their cameras smashed or their film stolen. But Campion managed to move through Iran without incident. It helped that he was French. The anti-American sentiment was, like, terrible. Really, they hate America. Because I'm, for them, America supports the Shah. They hate the Shah, so they hate the American. And uh, the fact that uh, Romini was in France in exile, and we were kind of the yeah, only country, non-Muslim country, who accept to have him over there was a huge plus. So Campion lingered outside the U.S. Embassy compound, waiting for the blindfolded and bound hostages to be paraded before the cameras or released. The embassy indeed was a world unto itself. No information came out of that embassy, uh, official or unofficial that we were privy to. We could go there for a while and look through the iron gates. Uh, we could read all the banners and graffiti on the walls. We could walk around the embassy if we wanted to, but we could get no information at all from inside in any way, shape, or form. All the information we got was from picked up from people outside. On January 14, 1980, the Iranian government ordered American news organizations to leave the country again, citing biased reporting. That didn't deter AP correspondents from chasing the story from the outside. They turned to radio broadcasts from inside Iran for information. Shahrazad Faramarzi, a former AP journalist who was born in Iran, worked her government sources from Beirut. As she recalls in this 2009 interview, they were very forthcoming. They would give me details of, let's say, the negotiations that were going on between Iranians and Americans over the hostages. The Washington Bureau would ask me 
could you find out what Washington is telling the Iranians, you know, through Algeria? I said, why don't you ask them? And they said they won't tell me. So I go up and phone them and they tell me. In April 1980, with the hostage crisis showing no signs of ending, Carter sent U.S. armed forces to rescue the 52 hostages. It was a catastrophic failure. Eight American service members died when their two aircraft collided in a desert field southeast of Tehran. It was my decision to attempt the rescue operation. It was my decision to cancel it when problems developed in the placement of our rescue team for a future rescue operation. The responsibility is fully my own. The fallout was significant. Relations between Iran and the U.S. sank even lower. Canadian press correspondent Bob Douglas captured the overall acrimony in this AP radio dispatch. Ayatollah Khomeini said in a statement read on state radio that if the United States should repeat its rescue attempt for the hostages, the government would be unable to control the militants controlling the hostages. And he then said later that if the United States does try a rescue mission, the hostages and the attackers will die. No one died, but the hostages remained captive for several more months. The government of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the United States finally reached agreement on resolving the issue of the hostages today. After extensive negotiations, they were released on January 20th, 1981. It was the last day of the Carter presidency and the day of Ronald Reagan's inauguration. And what of the Shah? He left the United States and made his way back to Egypt, still fighting cancer. He never faced trial, and he never saw Iran again. He died at age 60 on July 27th, 1980. The Shah's death was a final confirmation that a monarchical tradition had given way to an Islamic Republic that endures to this day.